Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's Tuesday morning, Tuesday, March the 31st, 2020. It's 11.02 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, great to see everybody in the uh, in the chat room today. How's everybody doing? Still hanging in? Hope you had a good weekend. Did you enjoy Two Dudes and Some Bullshit last night? Tony Michael and I watched Child's Play, uh, the original from 1988. Today, on episode 36 of McCray Live, I want to give you a, uh, a science fiction concept idea that I've had for uh, a while. And I mentioned this last night on Two Dudes and Some Bullshit during the Q&A. It's buried in, in the video, though. It's like probably, you know, two and a half hours into the show. Uh, but I thought, you know what? That would be kind of a fun little thing to talk about. Because obviously the world of entertainment, the news is very far and few between. Uh, I mean, I know that Morbius and, and Ghostbusters were, were pushed to 2021. But I, 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 I don't know about you, but I can't fill an entire show on that. Okay, so they've been pushed. Well, that sucks. Anyway, so, uh, you know, like, I mean, you know, that's just me. I mean, I'm sure there are people that, I mean, listen, I can, I can make the most inconsequential thing about the original Halloween. I can fill an hour, you know, I mean, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's different. But, uh, in the big picture, uh, obviously the uh, world of entertainment, uh, the news has been very far and few between other than just films being pushed. And, uh, you know, we can talk a bit more about that during the Q&A here today. But uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah, so uh, last night on Two Dudes and Some Bullshit, uh, you know, um, obviously we, we go to the Q&A part and we were uh, talking, uh, you know, you guys were asking all sorts of questions and I was talking about a uh, science fiction idea, a movie idea that I've had for years. I Actually, ever since I was in college, I've always been really, and now keep this in mind, I am not, I mean, <laughs> contrary to popular belief, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm really not. I know it's crazy. It's crazy to think. It's crazy to think that I am not, you know, a scientist. I know, I know, I know. I, I, I had you fooled. I know. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know, all those PhDs and shit on my wall. Uh, that's right. Uh, no, I don't have anything. Those are not PhDs. Those are just voice acting shit. But anyway, so, um, so, so, uh, I'm not going to have the, 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 the fine details of the science correct. Uh, I know that, but the concept of what I'm talking about, even the, you know, even a scientist will be able to get what I'm getting at. And I've always been fascinated by the theory of relativity and time and string theory and quantum physics. I've always been really into that kind of thing. And years ago when I was in college, I don't know why or how or what the context was, but I had this idea that for whatever reason, when I, I, I stayed in residence, okay, I was, I was in a dorm room on campus, uh, both years I was there actually. And f I, my imagination was running wild. And I don't know, one night I was sitting up, I, I, I was up late and I was writing a paper. This is the days when, you know, I mean, people, some people had a laptop, but really we were still actually writing papers, you know? So I was uh, with a pen. Yeah, kids, that's right. It's called a pen. This is a, uh, uh, this is a, uh, where do I have it? Do I have a pen here somewhere? I think I have a pen. Oh, here we go. Hey, hey, we have a goofy pen. This is a, this is a pen, kids. This is a pen. You, you use it to, anyway, so uh, I was up late and I was in the lobby. I'll use this as my prop. I was up late and I was in the lobby and I was, um, I was writing a paper. I forget what it was for, something on film. And it was late. It was like, oh, I don't know, probably like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I had a deadline I had to meet. And uh, I was in the lobby of the residence. And uh, the only people there were me and the person working the front desk, I think, the overnight. And uh, and I was, um, I was, yeah, and... And maybe a few people walked by. It was really late, really, really late. Quiet, right? You know, just ding, 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 ding. That's all you hear. And there was this kind of big bay window uh, that you could see sort of out into the parking lot. And if you looked a bit further, you could see the college kind of off in the distance. And I'm writing this paper and I'm looking out. And for whatever reason, I just started, my mind began to wander. I think I was up too late. And I started to imagine that I was in a spaceship. Like the residence was a spaceship like the star the like the starship enterprise i was gonna say the star trek enterprise uh the starship enterprise right where like you're on board this ship 
but it's got to have some sort of gravity shit because we're all standing upright walking as if we're just walking into like a convenience store on earth. We breathe fine. Everything's fine. Like we're just like in a mall. Right. And that's what I, I pictured. Like this residence, this building is floating through space and we are all whatever we're, we're on the ship for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I was the captain or something. I don't know. I don't know. I just started to think of this stuff. And how, and, and we're just, we're, we're, we're like light years. We're, we're, we're trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of miles, maybe even light years away from earth. I'm just setting the stage for this concept, right? I'm not saying that this has to be the concept, but this is how I, how the concept came to me. And I'm looking out the window and I just start to imagine space because it's nighttime and it's dark and I could see maybe like a, a street light or something. And I think I just, the, the glow from the street light made me think, you know, what if that was like a sun or what if that was a galaxy far, far away? Cause I couldn't make out any details because I'm just looking through the window and there's a bit of the reflection of the inside of the residence on the window. So it's not like I'm up like this where I can kind of, you know, see everything. Right. So I can only see kind of bits and pieces, right. You know what I'm talking about. And I can see maybe a glow, a bit of glow from a light or something. And I'm like, what if that's space out there? Like, what if it's space and we're all in this kind of thing? And I started to picture the, the galaxy of Andromeda. Okay, now the galaxy of Andromeda, I believe, is the closest, uh, the closest galaxy to ours. But it's still like, what is it, like 2.4 something, 3 million light years away or something ridiculous like that. Maybe it's even further. It's, it's, it's crazy. And it's on a collision course with the Milky Way. But it's something like 6 billion years away. That, don't worry, we're, we're, I think we're okay. Um, so, um, but it's kind of cool. And I've always been fascinated by the galaxy of Andromeda because I've always been fascinated by... Um, you know, extraterrestrial life and life on other planets. And are we, I don't believe we're alone. I'm not a religious person. So I have no issues discussing this at all. I don't believe that we're the only people in the universe. I don't. I think that's an incredibly, in my opinion, an incredibly naive, you know, ignorant thing to think. Uh, but that's a whole other topic, okay? But so I'm I'm fascinated by all of this, right? Like, you know, this concept, you know, worlds and galaxies, what the fuck is out there? And I just pictured like the galaxy of Andromeda out there, but it's far enough, it, it looks gigantic because it's it's huge. It's way bigger than the Milky Way. And it's out there and it looks gigantic. It's so gigantic that we think from the perspective of me, say the captain of the ship or something or whatever, right? I'm on the ship, is that it looks like we'll be there in like 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Because it's it's right there. It like fills up like the whole thing. But really it's still like a month away. Do you know what I mean? Because of the distance and how things look and things are perceived a, a bit different. You know what I'm talking about. But really, at the speed that we're traveling, we're still like a month out. You know what I mean? And I'm just picturing this, and I'm picturing what I would be thinking approaching this. And it's quiet, you know? Like maybe everybody's in bed or something. You know what I mean? And I'm looking out there, and I'm thinking to myself, just this, 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 this shot of this human being in this ship, this human looking out into this galaxy, not knowing what's in there. What's in there? What awaits us? Is there life? Are there people in there? Is there something in there? Is it nothing? What's in there? Is there another world? Do you know what I mean? Is there another earth? Is there another planet that maybe doesn't... I mean, listen, we, we, we and rightly so, it makes sense, we base our science on how we perceive the universe to operate, right? In the world of physics, you know, it, it makes sense. That's what we have to do. We have to apply science in the ways that we, we have come to learn and understand how the universe operates. But who's to say that every planet needs oxygen to sustain life? I mean, life as we know it to be, but maybe, just maybe, there's some life form out there that doesn't need H2O, that they breathe something else. Some other gas makes them breathe, right? You know what I mean? Like, we're always looking for the planets with H2O. Ah, uh, no, there's no oxygen there. There's no life. Well, well, yes, true. I mean, that's a good bet. There probably isn't. But who knows, right? I love all that kind of shit. So I just started to think of this idea about like what's in there and and time and how long it would take to travel. Like, this is the thing, like, like, and again, I, I'm not a scientist. I know it's crazy. 
It's crazy. It's crazy to think I'm not a scientist. I know. I had you guys fooled, right? I <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so I'm sitting there and my idea was, like I've been fascinated by the theory of relatively time, time, right? And we know this is pretty much, even though, I mean, obviously it's kind of a theory still, uh, we're pretty certain that this is true now. Uh, that we're talking about, okay, so, so when you, the faster you uh, come to traveling at the speed of light, the uh, time slows down for you. Time is relative, okay? We, we have actually proven this uh, in minor scales, not necessarily in astro type, you know. Um, but here on Earth, we can actually prove it with clocks and shit like that. And uh, time slows down. And uh, so, like, for example, uh, if I was traveling at the speed of light across the Milky Way and God knows where I'm going, right? And I travel it might take me like 10 years to get to Pluto, let's say. That's probably not accurate or true. I'm just, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? So let's, you know, it takes me 10 years to get over here. Well, I, I traveling at the speed of light, I've aged by 10 years, but you guys would have aged by 70 or 80 years. I'm not saying that's the exact science. It could be more, it could be less, but you understand the, the concept, right? And then by the time I get back, it's gonna take me another 10 years to get back. So I will have aged 20 years, but all you guys would be dead. And maybe your grandchildren and your grandchildren's children would be dead too, because 400 years have passed on earth. That shit is fucking wild. That is, that's time travel. I mean, in a, for all intents and purposes, right? Uh, I'm, I will have had to have aged as well, but not as much as you and not as much as people on earth. And I started thinking about that and I'm like, that's, that's fucking wild. That's wild. Like that is so cool. You know, it's like, whoa, like, and, and you see this science, you see this shit applied. The most recent movie, the most popular movie that this was probably applied to that you could see would be Interstellar. Uh, they use those concepts in Interstellar, right? Well, that shit is real shit. That's real shit, you know. And that's um, that's fascinating to me. Now, I actually I like the movie Interstellar. I was gonna say Interstellar. Uh, I um, I like. Wait a minute, is it Interstellar or Interstellar? It's Interstellar, right? No, no. What am I getting? I think I got this right here. Mm. It's Interstellar. That's right, not Interstellar. Interstellar. Yeah, so I was right. Um, so uh. I love that shit. I actually, I liked the movie Interstellar, but I uh, didn't love it. And one of the reasons why I didn't love it, I didn't really, I mean, look, there's moments that I felt for Matthew McConaughey. i oh, take off my shirt. Uh, there's moments I felt for him, uh, but I just, I felt we, I, I don't know, I wanted more breathing room for the characters. Originally, Steven Spielberg was attached to uh, direct that movie. And I'm not saying it would have been a better movie. I mean, who knows? Although he's one of the greatest, you know, if not the greatest cinematic filmmaker of all time. Uh, but I think... Nolan's uh, listen Nolan's great but I I have I just have this feeling that I would have been more emotionally attached to the characters in a Spielberg movie I think he does characters really well uh, and nurtures those characters well I felt I f didn't feel much for the characters the concept I love but, uh, loved excuse me but I was you know it was okay it was okay it, it was it was fine you know I've watched it twice it's fine but I much prefer the 1997 movie Contact with Jodie Foster and funny enough Matthew McConaughey uh much prefer that movie it's it's a different movie uh not quite I mean similar concepts um but I I like that movie better of course that has more to do with oh well, yeah I guess yeah I like that movie but anyway both movies they're they're concepts right fascinate me and and shit so I'm really fascinated with this time thing, you know, and the theory of relativity. I, I, it's mind blowing to me. And I, you know, I'm a kind of, you know, I'm the kind of person that thinks like, imagine that. No, no, like seriously, imagine that. And then the part that I talked about last night on Two Dudes and Some Bullshit was this, like I, I imagined a teaser trailer where like there's somebody in this ship, in this cockpit of the ship or something, right? And it's quiet. It's nothing. We just cut in and we're in this cockpit or something. And the guy is like doing a crossword puzzle or something, right? Something very human, very earth, very earthly created, right? 
of course, he's a human, so, you know. And he's there, and maybe he's in some sort of outfit or something, but nothing, like, cheesy, you know. And, uh, and he's sitting there, and he's by himself. Now, he's not necessarily by himself on whatever he's on. He's just, in this moment, in this room, he's by himself. And it's darkly, it's um, dimly lit, right? So you can see out into space because you have to turn the lights off in order to be able to see out into space, right? So it's kind of dimly lit in there, just maybe the cockpit lights or whatever. Kind of like some of the times how we see the Millennium Falcon, you know, kind of they turn the cockpit lights off. It's kind of dark. And he's there and he's looking out and he sees in the distance this blue, white, and green earth, but it's far away. And it looks close, relatively speaking, but he's still maybe two weeks away, right? Because it's so big. I mean, it's really small compared to a lot of shit out there, but it's, you know. He hasn't passed the moon yet. He's still far enough away that he can see it, but, you know, and he's looking at it. And I just thought to myself, what if he had been gone for 25 years? And we see him and he's like a, I don't know, maybe he's a guy my age. Right? Maybe he's 40, or maybe he's a bit older. Maybe he's 45, let's say, or close to 50, late 40s, let's say. And when he left Earth, he was 24, something like that, right? Or 25 or something. I don't know. Maybe he's 50 and he left when he was 30 or something. Who knows? Something like that. I think you get the idea I'm talking about. You can figure that shit out later. 20, 25 years has passed. And he's traveling home and he knows... That And again, the, the science is not accurate on this. But he knows that he's aged 20, 25 years. But people there, people in Earth, in Earth, on Earth, 500 years has gone by. That's not right. It's probably less than that. But let's say 150 years has gone by. Just watching you approach, just watching the earth coming closer to you, knowing, not knowing what the fuck is down there. Because there would have been some point where you lost communication, let's say. Like when you were leaving the earth, maybe at some point as far, you got far, you would lose communication. This is the, this is the fiction part of the science. Maybe, you know, you have to factor in because we have to entertain people, right? But there's just something at some point somewhere, you know, the stakes are high. It's like, well, at some point, you know, you're going to lose communications or maybe something happens happens where you lose communications like something happens to the ship and the communications go down or whatever and they you know and people on earth assume that they that you were lost you know i mean that's an idea that you were lost you know and they went on for another 200 years thinking that you were lost and you come back you fucking come back and you're approaching earth and you know you can't communicate but you know that 250 years has gone by on earth and you're, and, but you've only aged 25 years or 20 years and you're sitting there watching that blue planet get closer and closer, not knowing what the fuck is down there, not knowing if a fucking world war wiped everybody out, not knowing if a coronavirus wiped the entire population out, not knowing if an asteroid hit wiping everybody out or not, or, or that maybe there were 200 years more technologically advanced now and there's fucking spaceships flying around the earth and people are, yeah, who not? Like you have no idea. You just see it in the distance. And it's just the thought of what would be going through my mind if I was in that position that I think this concept, like I just picture, and my idea was, is that there's several ways you can do this concept. You can do the concept by leaving Earth and going to the galaxy of Andromeda, which by the way is what M31 that's the astrological code for the galaxy of Andromeda. I know some people probably think I got it because of Michael Myers. Myers 31. Hey, it it could be that. It could totally be that. But it actually is M31 is the is the astrological uh, code for or code or whatever it is for uh, Andromeda. Anyway, so um, like there's lots you could do. You, you could do both, right? Maybe you do it in like a fucking t two films or something like that. The first film you're leaving and the next, you know, and then the second film you're coming back. Whatever it is, it's just this idea that it's not a it's not a it, it's not a special effects film, right? It really is about the characters and their experiences. And he's not the only one there. I mean, maybe five people go. Maybe two of them die or something. I don't know. But there's it's a it's about characters. It's about the relationships and the concepts, the philosophical concepts. It's a very cerebral film. It's entertaining. It's not boring or anything like that. But it, it's more two thousand one than 
Star Wars. You know what I mean? It's it's not like that. Like it's not it's not you know it's more two thousand one and very much more two thousand one than than um uh like Independence Day or something. It's not like that. It's just the concept of seeing the galaxy of Andromeda and knowing that you're approaching, you don't know what the fuck is in there. And maybe you've lost communications or something, right? Or maybe you're trying to communicate, but you can't. You've already aged by 10 years because tra- I, I don't know how long would it take to get to the galaxy of Andromeda traveling at the speed of light. Let's look this up right now. Maybe maybe you'd be dead by the time you got there. Uh, speed of light to Andromeda. Maybe you'd have to go faster than the speed of light. Uh, based on Doppler shifting of its light Andromeda is speeding towards us. Okay, now I know that. How long would it, okay, hang on, hang on. How long would it take to get to Andromeda? Uh, ba, 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 ba. Andromeda, I know how long it is away. It's 2.5 million years, wait, wait. Andromeda is, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Andromeda is 2,538,000 light years away and at the speed of light at which at, at which uh, none other than light can travel. Wow, holy shit. Okay, so that just fucking, think about, like you would have to be traveling way faster than the speed of light. Listen to this, okay? Listen to this, all right? Andromeda is 2.5 million light years away. And right, right, right. So at the speed of light, it would try... It would take you 2.5 million light years to get there. Sorry, 2.5 million years to get there. 2.5 million years to get there. So maybe Andromeda, maybe Andromeda is a little too far out. Maybe that's a little too far out, but maybe not, right? This is science fiction. Maybe there's some, we've, we've, we know how to, we know how to bend space and time, right? As they talked about in uh, Interst- Interstellar, right? With black holes and all that kind of shit. Maybe there's a black hole that we find that we're able, some, something, right? Like we create this shit up, you know, whatever it is, right? And you're able to get to Andromeda, in not in 2.5, you know, it, it doesn't take you 2 million years to get to Andromeda. But think about that. Just even, that is, it's so mind-boggling to even think about. It's so mind-boggling to even think about that, uh, wait a minute, what's going on here in the chat? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know who this Tony Michael photography. Yeah, I doubt that's Tony. So, uh, sorry guys, interrupted by seeing some drama going on in the, in the chat room. So, uh, Tony wouldn't log in like that. So, uh, goodbye. Um, he's done. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. I don't know who that is. So that person is done. Sorry about that, guys. I uh, hate when that shit happens. Uh, but you get, you know, you get people in here that have no lives, right? Uh, so anyway, so, um, so yeah, so, okay. So, uh, I mean, I should have known this. Of course, if it's 2.5 million light years away, that is how long it will take to get there traveling at the speed of light because uh, one light year is how far light travels in a year. Of course, sorry, brain fart there, of course, of course. But but who's to say that there isn't another, like we bend, you know, we're bending space and time. There's black holes. We do some, inter, you know, interstellar shit, whatever it is, right? We we could still use the Andromeda concept, 100%, because who's to say that we can't get there by another means we found and we're bending space and we're using, well, what, whatever the case is. But it's just the concept of going vast distances, aging, because we have to age, right? And we got to go far enough. Like we can't just go and we age by four years because probably only 25 years will have passed on earth. You know, that's not a long time. We got to age like 25, 30 years, maybe even 40 years. And and then we got to, we're, we're coming back and it's like, oh my God, like 500 years have passed on earth or, or something ridiculous like that. Again, I don't know the exact science. Um, but I think it's just an interesting concept and the, whatever it is, the story is about the people aboard this ship and it's about, it's about returning to earth. Like let's say they're on a, the trajectory is they're coming back to earth, right? And they can see it. And the entire movie takes place on board this ship 
And the earth, throughout the entire movie, the earth is getting closer and closer and closer because that's the movie. It's about these people aboard the ship. It's about who they are, where they came from, you know, how they got there, where where they were. Maybe, maybe they're just coming back from somewhere where they've discovered life. They've discovered this planet that is rich with life and, and there's, there's an alien species there. And I don't mean alien like, you know, little green men from Mars. I mean, but there's an alien species there that is thriving, that has, that has a world, that has a, has, has uh, homes and 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 has a you know whatever it is, and they're coming back, you know, and 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 to 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 share this knowledge, and they've been gone for so many years, and people thought they were dead or something, and they've only aged by a certain, but so many years have passed on Earth, and and it's about this concept as and you see the Earth getting closer and closer in the window of the ship, and that it's like this suspense that's building through this entire fucking movie because through the movie, through the narrative, through exposition, through the building of these characters. Characters, through the drama that might inspire, through through the disagreements that might, you know, um, transpire, I should say, inspire, transpire, um, you know, we, you know, it's that suspense that, well, what is, maybe some people uh, have different ideas about what's going to be on earth. Maybe there's somebody that's like, no, we, we, like, we can't go back. You know, we should have fucking stayed on that other planet. Why are we going back? There's nothing there for us now. Maybe they've gotten signals that there could be nothing there. Maybe they've, they've, they've sent out signals and nobody's responding and they're watching their like, you know, science fiction shit. And they're trying, and, and they're like, we don't even know if there's anybody there. Like maybe, maybe at some point it was expected that an asteroid hit earth, or maybe it was, you know, um, uh, I don't know, something. And, and so there's doubt. There's doubt there's even anybody there. There's doubt there's even... And you're watching this drama unfold between these characters and the Earth getting closer and closer in the screen throughout the course of this, like, two, two and a half hour movie. Do you know what I mean? And the climax of the movie ends, like, you like, like you get, like, the... The end is that they they get to Earth, but the the thing is, do you show what actually happened, or do you leave it up to the audience in the audience's mind? That's the real kicker. There, that's the real kicker. Do you leave it up uh, to the mind of 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 these people? Right, that's the real kicker. Thanks for uh, handling all that, uh, Frank. Uh, really appreciate that. Anytime the douchebag piece of crap comes into the chat room, I'll just block him and he'll create more accounts and I'll continue to block him because he's a douchebag piece of shit is what it is. It's, it's not really, to, it's not really Tony folks. It's somebody, you know, so it's probably Devante because what Devante does is he goes away for a while and then he comes back because he's, because he's a scum sucking piece of shit. That's what he is. He has no life. You know, he just lives there and just, you know, it's what he is. Like, you know, those um, photos online, you know, you see a people like this, yeah, that's that's him. Uh, so uh, you know he can he can continue to come back and continue to get the little attention he needs because he's he's very insecure, you know, and he has an inferiority complex. So he has to come in here and get a little bit of attention, which is you know all right, all right. And he gets a little attention, we block him, and Frank deletes some of his messages, and you know away you go. Just the nature of the game, folks. Nature of the game. Uh, so I'll just continue to block him. Anyway, but yeah, so like, like you see this earth, you know, and it's that suspense. And the climax is like, they land on earth. Like the climax is is the moment where they, they, they finally are getting to earth and they're about to land on earth. But do you show it? Do you show it or do you leave it in the imagination of the audience? You know, do you leave it in the imagination of the audience? One of my favorite science fiction films of all time is uh, the movie Moon. The movie Moon with What's-His-Face. What's that guy's name? I forget the actor's name. He played Billy the Kid in in uh, The Green Mile. Great actor. What's his name? I always forget his name. The, the, the chat room will let me know for sure. He was in that low-budget science fiction movie Moon with Kevin Spacey as the voice of, of that uh, robot. Sam Rockwell. Thank you so much, Robert Thidoff. Yes, he's a great character actor. If you guys have not seen the science fiction film Moon, you've got to check it out. You'll thank me for it. You will love it. You'll be like, what? Like, oh, I didn't see that coming. So I don't want to tell you anything about it in case you haven't seen it. But those of you that have seen Moon, you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's just so good. It's just such a good little science fiction film. And um, and uh, there's concepts in there. Like you're, you're, you're kind of hoping, like it takes place on the Earth's moon. Like 
our moon, right? So it's not that far away. But when things begin to unfold and things begin to reveal themselves, you're like, oh shit, it's really good, really, really good. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my concept idea. Maybe we do have the galaxy of Andromeda in there, but then that brings a whole other thing in there because we do understand that uh, traveling to Andromeda, even at the speed of light, would take you several million years. So that's, we'd have to, like we'd have to use other, what might be perceived as theories right now in terms of, well, black holes are real, but in terms of like, you know, certain things about bending space time and, and, you know, all those things, we might have to include that kind of shit if we wanted to include the galaxy of Andromeda, but certainly coming back to earth and just seeing the earth in the distance and the entire movie plays out that way. Maybe it's on board the ship and we watch them talking about this and maybe it, it's, it's a, it's all about characters. We get emotionally attached to these characters, you know, and where they've been, we find out where they've been. Maybe there even is somebody on board the ship that's from that other planet that they were at. Maybe there's an alien species aboard that ship or something. I don't know. You know, it's just the concept of returning to a world that is home to you. That is no, no longer familiar to you. You have no idea what's down there. It's earth. But when you left, it was, you know, 2020 or something, right? But you, you're coming back and it's like the year 2532 or something. It's like no idea what's down there. All your communications are down. You lost communication like 15 years ago. To you, it's 15 years ago because you have only aged a certain amount. Uh, and this is stuff that's been proven. Like this is stuff that, that, you know, the theory of relativity exists, you know, they've proved it in, in small examples, even here on earth. And it's like, like even they did that, I think with the astronauts on the ISS, uh, where I think, what was it like when the astronaut comes home to earth or something, he's his, I don't know, his, his watch is like a, like a millisecond behind a watch on earth or, or something like that. I'm, I'm hazy on the details and it, it doesn't sound like a lot. No, a millisecond is nothing, you know what I mean? Or a microsecond or something, but you take that and you blow it up to the concepts that we're talking about on an astral sort of, you know, gigantic level. It's fucking wild to think of. And, uh, that's sort of, that's my kind of concept. Again, that's a concept that would have to be fleshed out and you would have to, you know, develop the characters, really figure out, you know, where did they start from on earth? You know, are they going to the galaxy of Andromeda? And if they are, then they have to be traveling faster than the speed of light. So you'd have to figure out something different. And if they are bending space time and black holes and it's more relative, it's more like real time than speed of light time. And, you know, but then again, may maybe certain planets have different different gravity and certain like, like there's there's so many different concepts i don't even pretend to fucking know i just know that my base level concept was spaceship coming back to earth they've been gone for 20 years their time but it's been like you know 200 300 four, whatever it is years on earth and they have no idea what they're coming back to and the entire movie takes place on this ship and the earth just keeps getting closer and closer and closer and there's there, that's all throughout this film we show shots of the earth you know it's close and then it's like this and then it's like this, you know, they're like it's getting closer because it's it keeps telling the audience, you know, it's coming. What's down there? What's down there? You know what I mean? It's like it's home. That's your home, isn't it? Or is it? You know what I mean? Like it's so like it's just I love it. I don't know. Do you guys like that concept? Do you think it's a, like an interesting concept? Again, it would have to be f um, fleshed out, right? But it's a, it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, and you'd have to sort of, again, it would have to be fleshed out. You'd have to write down the concept. You'd have to start writing the treatment. You'd have to write the characters. You'd have to really sort of really flesh the finer details out before you even begin to write a script per se. Uh, and really get sort of the, and, and get the science right too. Like, you know, you'd have to, um, uh, you'd have to, uh, you know, uh, talk to, you know, physicists and, and theoretical physicists and scientists and because you would want the science to be correct, right? You'd want the science to be a hundred percent correct. Um, but I just, I don't know. I, I thought of that years ago when I was sitting in my college lobby, looking out, the window that what if like what would what would that feeling be like even for the astronauts or call them astronauts you know or whatever what would that feeling be like you know to actually 
do that. You know what I mean? Like to actually be there and, and, and looking at your home planet. It's just, and, and knowing that hundreds of years have passed. Your kids, 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 kids don't exist. Like it would be like living in the 1500s and coming back to earth now. Think about that. Think about that. That's insane. Like that, that is, that's wild to me. And I love that shit. Anyways, if you guys are watching after the fact, comment below and let me know what you think of that. You know what I mean? And maybe some interesting, cool science fiction concepts that you've had before. You know what I mean? Uh, let me know. I would love to know. Uh, but again, it's my base sort of, again, it would have to be fleshed out, but that's sort of the ballpark of my idea of what I'm thinking about. You know what I mean? Comment below. I'd love to know. Hey, let's go over to the chat room and see what's going down. See what's going on with you guys. Let's check this out. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, it's not, it's not Tony Michael folks. It's more than likely Devonte Huntley who, uh, is, uh, uh, just, you know, creating Tony Michael photography accounts. Uh, uh, and uh, and every time he comes into the chat, uh, he will be uh, blocked. Uh, that's just the way it is. Every single time a Tony Michael photography comes into the chat, I just blocked the latest one, he will be blocked blocked it is that simple and jason and frank uh will do their job and delete any message he posts any message i don't care if it's if it's if it's uh, uh hey what's your favorite I don't, I, I don't care i don't care you're not tony michael you're so it, you, anything that comes in delete 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 uh so it's just the way it goes uh edwin a sordo says what's good dave have you heard of the um uh material uh vanta black it's the blackest black i haven't that's cool that's cool. I haven't. Yeah, folks, Tony, Tony, you'll recognize Tony because the actual account of Tony Michael, as uh, Jonathan Nichols says, he's a moderator. So if Tony was actually in the chat room, he would have a wrench as well beside his name. So, uh, and you would see it. You, you, you'd see his little face on the, on the thing and it would just say Tony Michael. It wouldn't say Tony Michael photography. Um, so uh, just, uh, just know. Just know. Uh, Life says, sorry about your trolls, Dave. The rest, oh yeah, no, no, no. No, it's it's one troll. It's probably Devante Huntley, the guy with the IQ of a, of a turnip who comes in and he continues to, you know, he, he, you know, he doesn't, you know, I guess I rubbed him the wrong way a long time ago or something and he just got upset and now he just likes to come in and troll people and give some satisfaction, makes him feel better because he doesn't have much going on in his life. So, you know, but when he comes in, he'll be blocked. It's just that simple. You know, if he wants to play nicely, Devante, there's always room to change, man. There's always time to change and become a good person and a constructive and a contributor. There, there's always that opportunity to be a decent dude. But if you continue being a dick and creating fake accounts with people's names, uh, then we'll continue to block you. It's just that simple. Um, Oliver Mercer sends in a super chat. Thank you, Oliver. Says, hey, Dave, I'm actually writing a script called Twin Earth with a different concept story, but kind of similar. Plus, I'm writing my Terminator Future Survival as well. Cool ideas, Dave. Thank you so much, Oliver. I really appreciate that. You know what movie I really like too? Speaking of Twin Earth, is that movie with... God, I forget her name now too, but she was in that Netflix series called The OA and it was called Another Earth. It was a low budget independent film, science fiction film with great science, science fiction-y concepts and uh, love that movie. If you guys haven't seen Another Earth, wait, okay, yeah, we're okay. If you guys haven't seen Another Earth, you have to check it out because it's a, it's a really cool movie as well. And Twin Earth, I like that idea. I like just the name. Now, again, I don't know what the name of my concept movie would be because I still have to flesh out sort of, are we going to Andromeda? And is it Andromeda that we have this kind of, th this kind of like, oh my God, you know what's in there? Or is it coming back? Excuse me, is it coming back to earth? Oh wait, I'm looking up there. I should be looking down here. I always forget that. There we go. Is it, is it, um, is it Andromeda? Is it Earth? You know, what's the situation, right? You know, or do we include both? Like maybe it's a, like, a, maybe it's two films. Maybe it's a trilogy. Who the fuck knows, right? I just know that it's not, it's not a science fiction movie in the sense of like Star Wars, which isn't really science fiction, it's more sci fantasy, um, science fantasy, but it, it, it's more of a, uh, it's not like Independence Day, like, you know, it's more of a, it's a, it's, it's an intellectual cerebral film. You know what I mean? And just, uh, all about those concepts, you know, it's like interstellar interstellar, I should say. Um, but it's more, um, 
there's more room to get emotionally attached to the characters. Um, it's not quite as Hollywood. It's more like I, I picture the 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 style and the the pacing and the feel more like a 2001 Space Odyssey or like Moon with Sam Rockwell. You know I mean, if you guys again, if you guys haven't seen Moon, you've got to check out Moon and watch it because it's a really cool like that type of pacing so i know look i know there are some people that think 2001 a space odyssey is the most boring film they've ever watched in their lives i get it i understand it when i first watched it when i was a kid i was about 12 i was like this is a boring piece of shit as a 40 year old man and since then so i probably rewatched it again when i was about 25 it's it, look it's it's a deep film there's deep concepts in there and uh it's terrific and again i'm not saying that my movie would be like like 2001 in the sense of the, uh, this, it's the same thing, but it's that kind of character study pacing, you know, where we really, and, and then there's just this earth that keeps getting closer and closer. And it's like, what the fuck is in there? You know what I mean? And anyways, yeah, I just, uh, I, I, I get excited about that kind of shit. It's so much fun. Uh, Jack Ellis sends a super chat. Thank you. Jack says, Hey Dave, do you believe in UFOs? Well, uh, I believe that, uh, Life exists on other planets. Yes. Uh, I believe that we have more than likely probably been visited. And I mean, probably over millennia, uh, going back thousands of years. Uh, I believe that to think that in a universe that is how are trillions, gazillions of years old, uh, how many planets are out there? I mean, there's, there's, what is it like a trillion stars and even in our own galaxy or something like that? I mean, it's just to think that there is not life somewhere else in the universe. And I don't mean microscopic life. I mean intelligent life. Now, that doesn't mean that they're bipedal and they're walking on all fours and they're like, hey, man, what's going on? I'm not necessarily saying that there's other humans out there, although there might be. And again, I'm not trying to paint a picture of humanoid, you know, the greys with the big heads and things. And who knows? Maybe maybe there's truth to that. I, I, I don't know. But do I believe that there is intelligent life out there in the universe? Yes. I mean, we'd be incredibly naive and ignorant to think not. And who the fuck, I mean, what a selfish, self-centered, egotistical thing to think that we're so special that we're the only ones. Come on. The probability of that alone is so low uh, that it's crazy. So um, I do I do think, I, I do think that there is, yes, when it comes to UFOs, there's, definitely been look there's there's definitely scams and bullshit photographs and photoshop photos and bullshit videos especially nowadays you know and yes 100 percent. do i think every ufo or strange thing you see in the sky is alien no because for years we thought the stealth bomber was an alien craft uh and it wasn't but do i think that there are some things that people see that are like that yeah I think so. I think so. But they're not getting here, you know, on fuel. I mean, they've they've mastered bending space and time or learning about things that we haven't even begun to learn about yet uh, because they would have to. They're not getting here on, you know, unleaded fuel at their fucking gas station. You know what I mean? It just, it's, it's not happening. Um, but it's fascinating to talk about. It's a really, I, yeah, but, you know, yeah, fuck, we could go on and on, man. So anyway, yeah, yeah, totally, totally, totally. Absolutely. And not in the creepy science fiction Hollywood way. I mean, like in a legit sort of way. Um, let me see here. Let me just go back, make sure I didn't miss any super chats. Uh, no. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Da na na na. Ba 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 ba. Oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And blocked. There we go. And blocked again. Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, let's see. Jonathan Nichols says, uh, Dave, thoughts on Jason Blum saying the trailer for Kills is coming soon? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on what he means by soon, right? I mean, um, he... Look, it, I, I don't pretend to know... I, I don't pretend to be in his head, but Jason Blum could be saying soon. You know, I mean, Ryan Turek said that about, what, a couple of weeks ago too? Three weeks ago or something like that? Like, what does soon mean? Does soon mean next week? Or does soon mean in June? I mean, it's... I think that's relative. I mean, if you think about it, a trailer coming in June, we're already April 1st, essentially. That's still pretty soon. You know, it may not be soon, 
soon soon like but it depends on what your idea of soon is you know um or is he saying that just to keep the hype going right is it just a matter of semantics you know he's like when is it coming it's coming soon it's coming soon he's just saying it to get you know it's not really you know he's just saying it to get people off his fucking back you know because it is coming soon i mean the movie's coming this year so the trailer is coming soon you know it just depends on what he means by soon does he mean soon how hardcore rabid fans would take it oh he said soon oh, he said soon it might be next week it's like no he no he just probably went yeah you know soon you know or does he mean it like that right you know where it's like soon yeah could be the end of may you know that's still kind of soon you know so it depends i i don't know what he meant by that i still would if the coronavirus if covid19 starts to improve if things start to improve and candy man doesn't get pushed even if candy man does okay but if candy man doesn't get pushed i still think that the goal was to release the trailer towards the end of may and have it play in front of candy man now candy man's not a blumhouse production but it, it, it is a universal distributed film Okay, and Halloween is again is once again being distributed by Universal Pictures. So I do think that that is the logical area. I, th I think that's a good bet. You release it maybe a week before Candyman comes out, and naturally, when you go see Candyman, the trailer's attached to that movie. Now, because of everything going on, could they release it before then, like in April? They might, they might do that, sure. And maybe that wasn't the plan, but like, hey, let's get, it. yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's a very, it's tricky to say, you know, it's tricky to say, but him saying soon could mean anything. It doesn't mean, it, it could mean next week. It could mean May 30th. I mean, who knows? Who knows at the end of the day? Uh, Big G says, hi, uh, why you think US government is covering up UFOs? Why do I think the U.S. government is covering up is covering up UFOs? Well, first of all, I never said the U.S. Uh, government was covering up UFOs, but I know that is a uh, that is a uh, popular opinion. Um, it's compartmentalized, you know. I I think we have to understand that when top secret things, whatever it is, whether you buy into certain conspiracy theories, whether you are into UFOs, we have to understand that. You know, these things, these top secret, like there are clearances, believe it or not, and some of you Americans may not know this, but there are clearances that are even higher than the president of the United States. Even the president of the United States does not have access to everything. Did you know that? It's true. There are certain high level that is so secretive that even the president of the United States doesn't have access to. He So it's it's like... Depending, like, the, these things are compartmentalized. Like, the right hand often doesn't know what the... Like, it would be like me. Like, there's this thing... Okay, there's this... I believe this anyway. There's this... Um, there's this... Uh, there's this idea that... In order for a conspiracy, or in order for something to take place, thousands of people would have to be in on it or know about it and that is simply not true that is just not true this this it's not true at all all a conspiracy means now look depending on the size of the conspiracy uh there would probably be more than you know two people knowing about it but what a conspiracy is is that you, you have to have at least two people conspiring together that's it that's it now, obviously, depending on the conspiracy, there's probably more than two people. But this idea that that thousands of people would have to know and be in on it is simply not true. I can, you could work for me, and I could uh, get you to. I say to you, I say, uh, let's take somebody here. I say, uh, Mason. I'm like, hey, Mason, like, can you mail that for me? And you're like, sure, no problem. You take it, and you mail it, and you don't even know that you're mailing anthrax. You have no idea. You just go and you're just doing your job. You're just doing your job and you're mailing anthrax and you have no idea that you just did that. You know, not everybody is connected that way. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing a lot of the times and things are very compartmentalized and a lot of the times they get people or they, you know, you're, you believe you're doing things in the most purest you know, ethical way. And in reality, there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that, aren't really happening, you know, in that sense, you know, and, and so there's, 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 yeah, there's just, there's, 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the, so when we say is the U.S. government hiding something, what do you mean by government? Do you mean just like, like Trump, you know, and the House of Representatives? No, no. They probably don't know their asses from their elbows about anything that's going, I mean, maybe some do depending on how connected they are, but there are a lot of black op shit that happens. There's a lot of, there's the government, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, conspiracy here, but we know that there's the government, the day-to-day -day shit, and there's a lot of shit that we know that that goes on that nobody knows. Like, you know what I mean? There's there's black op shit that happen all the time. You know what I mean? All the time. Uh, so it, there's shit that goes on that would blow our fucking minds away that probably even the president of the United States doesn't know at all. You know what I mean? And again, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial. I'm just saying that we know that shit goes on. You know, like, I mean, it's crazy shit. You know what I mean? And and um, so when we say the U.S. government, we got it like, no, I don't think just the, you know, like the regular people who work for the government know anything. No, I don't think so. If it's true, if it's true. That's what I think. Anyway, that's what I think. That's my opinion. People can can obviously comment below and, and say, Dave, you're being good. No, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial. I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to be. Just saying. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, Frank Riker sends a super chat, says... Uh, Dave, can you do the space balls we're at now, now, uh, uh, but about the kills trailer? Uh, oh, okay. How would I do that? Um, uh, how would I do that? Oh, uh, this uh, about the kills trailer. You mean just like looking at the kills trailer? What the hell am I looking at? When does this happen in the kills trailer? It happens now. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. We're at now, now. We'll go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why? We missed it. When? Just now. When will then be now? Oh, I see. Soon. I see. I think I know what you're getting at. When will kills come out? Yeah. Uh, so it'd be more like, uh, be more like, uh, when does the Halloween kills trailer come out? Of course, no, it would be at the end of that soon. So, uh, yeah, I'd have to figure out how to how, how to work the words in there to make it fit. But uh, that's funny, though. I, I, I memorized that. That's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, if not the my favorite, like the favorite scene of mine in the movie. So it's just, uh, yeah, that's it's funny shit, man. I love that. Uh, uh, that moment. Uh, Chris Baber sends a super chat. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. it says, Joe Exotic is innocent and kind of stupid. Carol uh, Baskin killed her husband. I'm not familiar with, with uh, I'm not familiar with who you're talking about there, but I will say this. Uh, I, um, I, uh, the other night, I, I mentioned this last night on Two Dudes and Some Bullshit. Uh, the other night, I, um, I was, uh, I was watching, uh, and, and I've seen this many times, like I've seen this many, many times, but I am really fascinated with the John Bonet Ramsey case or the Jean Bonet Ramsey case, I should say. Um, and, uh, I, for one, I, I, the, you will never convince me that those parents are not lying sacks of crap. You will never convince me that they are not lying sacks of crap. There was no intruder. Patsy Ramsey absolutely wrote that ransom note. It is so extraneous, way overselling, hundred percent. That and now, I, now I don't know who killed the little girl. Okay, I don't know if it was the mom or the dad or Burke. I don't know. I know there's a documentary that claims that it might have been Burke, and so, I, I get it. But I'm telling you right now, it was one of those three. It was there was no fucking intruder that, and if John Ramsey ever watches this which he won't but if he ever did you are a lying sack of crap and you know it I'm sorry that's how I feel about that anyway and it's my right to say that uh <laughs> But yeah, I'm fascinated with that kind of shit. Fascinated with stuff. I love watch and the John, oh the Jean Benet Ramsey case, man. That poor little girl. Oh my god, that, that poor little girl. And get your kids. Listen, I know there's some people that live in the South that watch me. I know pageants are a very Southern thing, but folks, come on, don't dress up your kids like that. Don't do that. They're just little kids, man. They're just little kids. Anyway, that's how I feel about it. Uh, let me see. Uh, Devante is, is persistent today, folks, but that's because he has, you know, is a very low IQ. So, uh, TMB says, Dave, you have a great community here. Thank you very much, buddy. Says question. Do you think we'll ever watch, see, and hear the Eric Stoltz footage from back to the future? Uh, do you think the two original actors would uh, alter the feel of the film? A hundred percent. They would alter the feel of the film for sure. I mean, listen, everything around them is the same. I mean, you still have Crispin Glover playing the dad. You still have, uh, 
Christopher Lloyd playing, you know, uh, Doc Brown, obviously. So, so it's not like the entire, like there would be this sudden weird feeling to the entire movie per se, but it definitely would change the feeling of Marty McFly a hundred percent. There was a different feeling that, uh, the Stoltz, uh, yeah, Eric, Stoltz was bringing to the character. Will we ever see it? Well, I do know. I think you can see. Aren't there clips on YouTube or something? Like, aren't there little things? Because I've seen, or maybe it's in a Back to the Future documentary or something. Because I've seen clips, not like fully fleshed out scenes, but I've seen. I've seen him on set in the garb. I've seen it, not just in photos, but in video. So it either was a Back to the Future documentary, or maybe it was I don't know something. But I've seen it. I've totally seen it. Will we ever see it though? Like in a fully like, like a, like a release of back to the, well, let's not forget that he wasn't in the entire movie. Like he made it maybe a quarter of the way through and then they recast. Like he didn't shoot the entire film. So I don't think we'll see, I don't think we'll see it like, like an official sort of, no, I don't think so because I think it's disrespectful to Michael J. Fox, Marty McFly. And uh, I think we may see it as like, oh, here are, here are the scenes, you know, beep, Roll camera, you know, and you kind of see those behind the scenes stuff, but uh, never in an official sort of um, an official sort of light. No, I don't think so. Uh, let's see here. Uh, great question, though. Big G, uh, Big G says, in your opinion, in your opinion, who was the Zodiac killer? Oh, another great one. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I have to brush up on Zodiac again. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure, but I will say that the Zodiac movie that came out in 2007 with Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Ruffalo, really underrated. It, it, listen, it was directed by David Fincher. If you love Fincher films like Seven and Fight Club, and you've got to watch uh, Zodiac from 2007. It is engrossing, fascinating, uh, great great movie uh, one of fincher's best and and ironically an incredibly underrated film so you've got to check it out uh oh uh chris baber says i was referring to the latest joe exotic craze on netflix i've never yeah i've never heard of joe exotic before in my life uh but i have but the, 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 there's this tiger king thing what the heck is tiger king i have no idea i i have to check it out uh tiger king biggest conspiracy around here is the death of kennedy thoughts yeah, that is, well, I, I will tell you right now, uh, my thoughts as a Canadian, um, but I mean, it's not even as a Canadian. I think uh, a lot of people share this. Um, I do not believe Oswald, uh, I, do, I do not believe, no, I, I don't think Oswald, if he, if, he wa okay, if he was a gunman, if he was in the sixth floor depository, you know, on the sixth floor there. If he was there, he wasn't the only guy. He wasn't the only guy. You know, let's not forget, back and to the left, back and to the left. The magic bullet, the whole thing just reeks of conspiracy. I don't buy it at all. We know the autopsy photos were were, were altered. Uh, no, I, the Warren Commission's official report is a sack of, I don't, don't buy it at all. I'm not saying Oswald, I do believe Oswald was into some kind of shady shit and he was a patsy. They, they used him, 100%. 100%, they used him because they knew they could. They framed him and they knew they could. Exactly, you know, and then Jack Ruby, of course, shoots him dead and it's kind of like you know why would you need to do that and if you didn't need to keep somebody quiet um no i i believe that uh kennedy was uh murdered uh because uh well for a variety of reasons um but yeah he was murdered by i don't know lyndon johnson is a was a scuzzy he knew he knew lyndon jo lyndon johnson hated kennedy hated kennedy and, uh, anyways, we could talk about that for hours, but the question was, do I, what do I think? I, I, yes, I, I do think that, uh, it was not all, I, I lean to it not being Oswald at all who took those shots at all. And I believe there was more than one gunman. And I believe the fatal blow was taken from the front, was taken from the front, whether that's the grassy knoll, whether that's somewhere else, but it was from the front. I absolutely hundred percent. I'm convinced of it. And, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. No, I don't think it was just Oswald that just was shooting. And no, don't believe that at all. But that's me. That's me. Uh, Mason James sends in a super chat. Thank you so much. Mason says, uh, why do you think Michael is only violent when the mask is near him? 40 years in Smith's Grove without incident. Uh, okay. Let me see if I understand this. Uh, is only violent when the mask is, I don't think that's the, well, I don't think it has anything to do with the mask. I think it's just the, uh, I think it is, if we're talking about Halloween 2018, I don't think it has anything to do with the mask. I think it has more to do with the psychological makeup of being reminded of certain things. Uh, I don't think Dr. Sartain was being antagonistic towards Michael all those years. At least I don't get that impression, although he sort of was kind of at the end there. Um, but clearly when Aaron and, and uh, you know, what's-her-face approach him as he's standing chained up. I mean, he's being antagonist. Say something. Come on. He's being antagonistic, which I thought was kind of weird. Um, I don't think it has anything to do. I mean, the mask can be a psychological reminder. Yes. Cause it's a visual representation of something that happened 40 years ago. But I think you could do that with, with anything. You could show him a picture of Annie and it might, produce the same results you could show him a picture of dr loomis might produce the same results you could show him a picture of the doyle house might produce the same results it's a triggering effect for him um and it might be more so than a bit of others because it was the mask that he wore but i don't think there's anything supernatural attached to it you know i don't think there's anything like that i think it's just a it's a trigger for that event you know what i mean that's what i think anyway uh, bu 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 oh no, that was, I, I answered that one. Okay. Did I not? Wait, let me just see here. No, I did answer it. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure I did answer it, folks. I did. Uh, super chat comes in from Frank Riker. Thank you, buddy. Would you like to see alien nation come back? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Alien nation. God, was that, I know what you're talking about. I just want to make sure 1988. Yes. Yes. And the people with the spots on the, yes, that is what I thought. Uh, Cause there was a, yeah, I'm going to, I remember seeing it as a kid, but I'm going to say, I don't care. Let's just put it this way, Frank. I haven't thought of it in quite a long time. So there must not be a, you know what I mean? It's more of a personal thing, obviously, in terms of, well, not personal, but uh, uh, person to person. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, more specific in that sense. But uh, uh, yeah, I never really was into it. Never really was into it. I remember it though. It's funny. As soon as you said it, I thought of the 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 alien heads with the the kind of the spot marks. And sure enough, as soon as, soon as I brought it up, there it was. That's funny. It's funny what you remember. It's funny what you remember. Uh, let me see here. What's going on? Great to see you guys in here. We are an hour and 62 minutes into episode 36 of McCray Live. Yeah. Fat, you know what? Those concepts are really, they're deep and they're, and I, you know, these are the kind of movies that wouldn't necessarily be, you know, billion dollar films per se, because they're not, you know, gigantic, you know, special effects spectacles, but I love the concepts in them. I love the concept in them. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff indeed. Um, excuse me. Just a couple of emails coming in. I want to make sure. I have a, uh, uh, I'm probably only going to go till about 1230 today, guys, uh, which is sort of in the ballpark of what I do anyway when I don't have a guest on. Uh, but I, because I have, uh, I have to get ready. I have some national spots I'm doing. I'm connecting with a studio. I think I'm connecting with a studio in, uh, they're either in New York or in Carolina, somewhere down there. There, there it's uh, one uh, national spot and two national radio ads, uh, which I will um, uh, let you know when they're airing, so you, you guys south of the border can uh, take a look out for them. Uh, playing the, uh, it's 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 funny because in the TV spot, uh, they have an actor in the spot, right, and he's saying his lines, but they've they've I don't know why they're doing it this way, but they've hired voice actors to actually dub over their lines. So you won't see me, but you'll hear my voice coming out of somebody else, which is kind of interesting. Uh, they, they do do that. I mean, that is not an uncommon thing to do. Uh, why they're doing it specifically for these spots, I don't know. But uh, 
Interesting. Uh, DMT Infinity says, Dave, if you had to give a crossover concept for two slashers to appear in the same movie, who would they be and how would you personally go about it? I don't mean with some huge clash in the end. Um... Well, it would be original. I would never cross over Jason and Freddy, Michael and Leatherface. I wouldn't do that. I, I would create two original, well, like you said, concept. I, I, but I don't know what it would be. Just two original slashers that can coexist in the same universe, in the same movie. Uh, maybe they're working together. Maybe they work together. Maybe they're working together and you get, you know, yeah. And now you have two slashers to, to like, there's no, they're not building towards each other. Like, like, as you said, some big climactic moment, maybe they're, maybe they're working together. Maybe that's what's going on, you know, and, uh, and everybody's, you know, afraid of them. And, and uh, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe they're, they're working together in some sort of weird capacity. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting. But I think that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Uh, Tony Movie Chappie D9 Neil Blumkamp, number one fan. Wow, number one fan says, Hey, Dave, you guys next, uh, Dave, you guys next commentary should be paranormal activity. Well, it won't be paranormal activity. What Tony and I do is we don't, we don't usually make up uh, our shows on the, like, you know, the day before. We usually have a, um, a schedule that we have and we like to keep to it as much as we can unless there's like massive breaking news and we want to restructure a show for whatever reason. Uh, but I can tell you the next two shows will not be paranormal activities. So uh, I, I'll have to talk to Tony and feel if we want to do that. Um, I don't know if we'll do that or not because uh, we do have other things that we're doing after these couple of weeks as well. But you never say never. You never say never. You never say never ladies and gems uh mark striano striano uh dave the answer to your question the other day uh i live in colorado and i mentioned uh 9, feet elevation okay cool yeah i remember you saying that and i remember me saying are you, you know are you in colorado and because you had to be somewhere there you had to be somewhere there beautiful man colorado beautiful i live in colorado i would beautiful it's beautiful there. Uh, Duke Fleet says, Dave, uh, what do you think happened at the end of 2001 Space? Oh, man. That's a loaded question, my man. I don't know. I I, I think, because um, I haven't watched it in a f quite a few years, so I'm just going by from what I remember. I think it is about, like the con like there's many concepts happening there. It is about, I think, reincarnation is one. I think, I mean, clearly the theory of relativity plays a huge part in this. Uh, I think he's seeing, he, he sees himself older as he was or as he, yeah, it's, that's a load. Of, I, because I love that movie so much and I care about answering this I don't want to answer it in a willy-nilly way. I got to watch the movie again because there's no doubt. Like when he's lying there in the bed, Dave, when Dave is, when he's lying there in the bed and the monolith, you know, is on top of, there's, I, I got to watch it again because I don't want to, I want to do justice to answering this question because I, uh, this is a, I, I don't want to just be like, well, you know, something, something. Nah, man, it's, it's too, I love this movie. It's too, it's too cerebral. It's too involved. It's too, I, it's too, it means too much to me to be able to answer it willy nilly. But I will say this. I do think the concepts of reincarnation and rebirth, I think are, are, are obviously very apparent when you have the star child in the, you know, in the, in the, um, in the bubble looking down on earth, that great score building. And, you know, everything coming full circle. Because obviously, you know, we start with the apes and things like that and the building of tools and the progression of life. And, you know, it's it's a whole thing, man. It's a whole thing. It's a great question, but it's not something I can just answer like that because there's so many different layers to it that I want to go back and I want to have another look at it and write some things down um, and then sort of come at it from that perspective. I, I just want to do myself justice because it's it's really cool. It's really cool. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Super Chat comes in from... Hang on. Uh, Van, Van Ramersdal? Van Ramersdal? 
Anyway, Billy uh, says, your thoughts about Elvis conspiracy theory? Well, I have a bit of Elvis. Uh, I can actually talk from a perspective here because uh, my dad, uh, for those of you that may not know, most of you probably already do. My dad, uh, he passed away in 2011. He's not with us anymore. But my dad was a very prominent Canadian uh, columnist and journalist. And uh, he, I, like I said, I've said this a few times, but behind me here on the wall, I have photos of my dad with the Beatles, with Robert Kennedy, with Burton Cummings of the Guess Who, him and my mom with Liberace. I have a photo of my dad with John Candy. I still have to put up. My dad was a gigantic Elvis fan. And my dad was actually going to meet Elvis, uh, but he died. I think my dad was, was it was being set up for, for my dad to meet Elvis the summer Elvis died. Uh, so obviously that didn't happen. But my dad, being the gigantic Elvis fan he is, uh, created this fun... Of course, he didn't... He played it off as it was serious. But of course, being his son and growing up with him, I knew it wasn't. Uh, but it was a satirical take on, on the conspiracy that Elvis faked his death. And uh, there are some people that really believe he did. I don't think he did. I think he died. Uh, and my dad really believes that too but the in about the late 80s there were a lot of rumors going around that there were even documentaries on it news people you know news outlets covered it that elvis was seen here seen there seen there and my dad knew this uh guy uh named mo atala who owns the newport restaurant in ottawa ontario ottawa is sort of the it's it's the washington dc of canada and um, that's where I grew up as a boy from about 10 to 20. Went to high school there and everything. Anyway, so uh, my dad uh, created this uh, charity called the Elvis Sighting Society. And the gimmick, the shtick, the story is that Elvis is alive and living in Tweed, Ontario, Canada. Now, if you know where Tweed is, most of you probably don't because most of you live south of the border. Tweed is a little sleepy town between Toronto and Ottawa. Okay, it's got maybe, I don't know, maybe 1,500 people or something. Not a lot, maybe a bit less even. Sleepy little, beautiful town, but sleepy. And my dad, when taking to, to um, when uh, sharing custody with my mom, because my mom lived in Toronto, my dad would drive uh, from Ottawa to Toronto and vice versa. And we drive through Tweed a lot. So, and my dad used to comment of how sleepy town it was. Can you imagine if Elvis lived here? So he made this thing about how, how Elvis is alive and lives in Tweed, Ontario. And and that was part of the Elvis site and the uh, the Elvis Sighting Society, which was a charity. Um, uh, its headquarters was at Moe's Newport Restaurant, and my dad would write about this because he was a columnist. He'd write about it, and the Newport was filled with Elvis memorabilia and articles. My dad would write it. It still is to this day, although it switched locations. It's, it's moved down the street because Mo wanted to downsize, so it's not in the same location, but still the same. All that kind of shit. Well, wouldn't you know it? In 1992, or 93, I should say, Jerry Springer, the Jerry Springer show. Yeah, that Jerry Springer. Now, this was a, when Jerry Springer first started, okay? He wasn't the talk show he became. He wasn't, there wasn't fighting and nudity and swear. He was like a Montel, okay? A Montel Williams, okay? Uh, that's the kind of show he was when he first started. He was just a regular talk show. So my dad, the, uh, the Jerry Springer show got wind of this and asked my dad to come on the Jerry Springer show in 1993 and talk about how Elvis is alive and living in Tweed. But the thing is, my dad knew a guy named Bruce McGregor, who was a high school teacher who could do a flawless Elvis impression. And I mean flawless. He couldn't sing like Elvis but he could speak like Elvis and have you convinced no problem. No problem. You hear him and you're like, holy shit, that sounds like Elvis Presley. It doesn't sound like somebody doing Elvis Presley. It sounds like Elvis Presley. And so my dad got him to come on the Jerry Springer show. Of course, anybody watching from the Jerry Springer show now, I don't even think it's around anymore. They're like, what? That was a lie. Oh, come on. Pfft, like you guys didn't know. But anyway, so... My dad is on Jerry Springer and they have 
Elvis calling in from Tweed, Ontario, okay, uh, to the show. And they have him there. And the whole it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. I remember this. My dad went on Jerry Springer twice, once in 1993 and once again in 1995. This whole thing about how Elvis is alive and lives in Tweed, Ontario. My dad is selling it like you wouldn't believe. And the last time he was on in 95, that's when Jerry was starting to make that that switch that that more jerry jerry you know and all that and the whole thing and my and then i remember asking my dad as a teenager saying would you go on now if they asked he's like i'm not no i would never go on now but when my dad went on the first time it was just a regular talk show and they had my dad there selling it my dad is so fucking convincing he's so convincing you could i mean if you did i mean you the only way you would not believe my dad is if you don't believe that Elvis faked his death. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you're like, no, Elvis didn't fake, that's a fucking conspiracy theory. Then clearly you're not going to believe my dad. But you're not going to not believe my dad by anything my dad is saying. My dad was totally convinced. Totally convincing. He, he's, he's being dead fucking serious and selling it like I've never seen anybody sell anything in my life. So if you didn't believe him, it's not because you don't believe him. It's because you just don't believe that Elvis, you know, is alive. You know what I mean? So it's, it was so, and as a kid, it was like, your dad was on Jerry Springer. It's like, not that Jerry Springer, this, like picture Montel Williams. Like that's, that's what Jerry was when he first began. Anyway, so uh, I have quite an Elvis sort of uh, history with with Elvis, and I love Elvis. I grew up on a he on a healthy dose on a healthy dose of Elvis Presley. I know a lot about him. He was born January eighth, nineteen thirty five. I think it was January eighth, nineteen thirty five. Died August sixteenth, nineteen seventy seven. Um, and uh, yeah, I know quite a bit about Elvis Presley. Uh, do I think he's alive though? No. I think he's dead, but he was very much alive for most of my childhood. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So that's a funny story that I don't tell too often on this channel. Um, and obviously now it's buried within this video. So it's not like anybody's really going to hear it or see it. Maybe I'll do a separate video on that where I tell some funny stories uh, from childhood that I think would be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, Smith's Grove says, Dave, is it on YouTube? It's n I don't know. I don't believe so, but I have a copy of it. I, ha I had it on VHS and I digitized it and I have a digital copy of it. So I don't want to get I don't want to get dinged because I don't know who owns the rights to the Jerry Springer show now. Even if it's not on, somebody still owns that 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 IP. So I, I don't know, or the 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 copyright on it. I don't want to get dinged, but maybe I'll what I could do is I could get some still frames and uh at the very least post them on social media or something. Or maybe I'll post a clip. Excuse me, it's all the water I'm drinking. Maybe I'll post a clip or something like that. Um, but, oh yeah, oh no, it's it, it happened, folks. Oh yeah, I, I have it. Earl McRae was my father. So uh, I, I have it. Oh, he, he's there, he's there. And it was fucking wild. <laughs> but the thing that, the icing on the cake was the guy that they got to call in. It was like, oh my God, you know? And that was the shtick. And my dad never let up never let up. He carried that to the grave in terms of like the Elvis Science Society and the whole thing. And no, and he even like, there's a story about him and how Mo, which is the guy that owns the um, restaurant, how they went out one day into the down one lonely street in Tweed to meet Elvis and they met Elvis and they even had, you know, W5. If anybody knows W5 here in Canada, Okay, that's like a news magazine program. It'd be like, I don't know what it'd be. It would be like a 60 Minutes in the States or like a, a 2020 or something like that, right? In Canada, I don't know if W5 still exists, but on CTV here in Canada, there was W5. And W5 did a whole thing on it back in like 1989. They followed my dad and his friend out to the, you know, the the lonely town of Tweed. And they did this whole thing. It was this whole thing. And I, as like a 10 year old kid, I'm like, this is fucking hilarious. And, but it was, it was a, it was a whole shtick. And when my dad died, of course, then kind of the cat was out of the bag at that point. Right. You know, I, I think Bruce McGregor did an interview where he was like, no, no, I was the voice of Elvis and blah, 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 which I know to this day, I know as soon as I saw that and sort of the cat, you know, not that anybody thought the cat was ever in the bag. You know what I mean? I mean, come on. I mean, it's not like anybody ever thought it was actually in the bag, but I remember, uh, I remember reading an article that Bruce McGregor did about how he was the voice 
of Elvis and things like that. And I, I remember thinking my dad would be upset because my dad, even though he was gone, he would have loved that to carry on. You know what I mean? And I remember thinking, I know my dad would be upset right now that the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. And it's like, dad, I don't think the cat was ever in the bag, but my dad loved it. My dad loved, I think it was my dad's way of living vicariously through Elvis because he missed out by just a couple of months on the chance to meet him. And he was a huge Elvis fan. You know what I mean? So anyway, crazy story, eh? crazy story, folks, crazy story. Uh, Jack Ella sends a super chat and says, please schedule JFK for near November 22nd. Oh, the movie JFK, maybe. Yeah, that's a long movie though. It's about three hours long, but yeah, maybe. I'll, I'll uh, mention it to Tony and, and I'll see what he thinks. Super chat comes in from Andrew L. Thank you, buddy. He says, what's a movie that punches you in the gut? Punches me in the gut in what way? Like that makes me emotional, makes me sad, makes me sick. What way do you mean, Andrew? What way do you mean, my man? Um, uh, Smith Grove says, your dad sounded like a cool cat. He was cool. I mean, you know, I grew up in a media family and, and uh, you know, I had access to certain things and people that the average person would not, for, for which I don't take for granted. Now, for the, for the, most of my father's journalistic career, he was he was a sports writer. And I don't mean just writing like, you know, about scores and things like that. Like he wrote features like about on athletes and things like that. And uh, I remember um, I got to meet a lot of NHL hockey players that I idolized and, and things like that. I got to go into the dressing room of the Buffalo Sabres, my favorite hockey team when I was like 12 years old. And I got to meet Pat LaFontaine and, you know, I got to meet Alexander Mogilny and Dave Anderchuk and Dale Howarchuk and, you know, and it was cool, you know, and Pat LaFontaine, he's a hall of famer. He's one of the greatest, you know, players of all time. And I got to meet him and talk to him and it, it, it was cool. I mean, it was definitely cool. But to me, as it is to a lot of kids growing up with, with, uh, you know, celebrity fathers or whatever, parents or whatever it is. I don't really don't think of that in that way. But in that sense, to me, he was just dad. He was just dad. So, um, and uh, and I never wanted to be a journalist. I, I wanted to, I was very much into the movies and the acting and the performing and things like that. And that's what I got into. Uh, I never wanted to be a writer per se, like he was, but uh, he could piss you off. Like, he could piss you off one moment and tell it like it is. And it's really not, you know, it's not PC or whatever. And then the next day in an article, he could make you cry because he wrote something incredibly fucking amazing. He was that kind of a writer. So uh, cool stuff. Uh, Jason Nike says, I watched someone's watching me last night. Great suspense in that Carpenter flick. Yeah, really nice moments in that movie. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let me see if uh, did, um, uh, did Andrew L... Oh, did Andrew L, uh, I don't think he came back with clarification. Oh, emotional. There it is. Emotional. Uh, well, I would say emotional for me, the two off the top of my head that I can think of immediately would be the, uh, animated film Inside Out. Like I'm telling you towards the end of that movie, I'm like, holy shit. I'm like choking up here. And the very first time I watched Forrest Gump, the very, and not so we're going back like 25 years ago, but the very first time I watched Forrest Gump, I remember being emotional. Not, 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 I've never cried. I've never in any movie that's, that's hit me that way. I've never actually cried. Tears have never come down the face, but there have been many times where I have felt the big gigantic, you know, train plane size lump in the throat where you're like, Oh really? Am I going, Holy shit. This is, this is really affecting me. You know what I mean? Definitely that. Definitely that. Uh, but, um, but, but, oh, Frank Riker says, here's a little clip of Dave's dad. Oh, where did you find this? What's this? Is this one of my dad's McMinutes? Oh, oh, wait a minute. The, what year was it? This was January 12th. This is an article. Oh, that is the article that Bruce McGregor is talking about. Uh, yes, that's the article that Bruce McGregor's talking about. He's he's come out now. He's since my dad has died, Bruce is now sort of letting the cat out of the bag. You know what I mean? When like who really thought the cat was in the bag? You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, thanks for spotting that, Frank. Really cool. That's the Ottawa Sun. Yep. Uh, click on that, and that will that's an interview with Bruce McGregor who talks about uh, how he was the voice of Elvis. And I'm telling you guys, he he sounded like Elvis Presley. Like 100% sounded like Elvis. 
There's no, there's no issues. Like if you know Elvis and you, you're like, holy shit, that's Elvis Presley. You know what I mean? Uh, very cool. Thanks for finding that, Frank. Yeah, that's the article. That's the article that I read uh, way back then. And I was like, oh, really? They did that? Oh, my dad would be upset. My dad would be upset. He'd be like, oh, guys, don't let it out. You know, so I'm dead. Keep it going. Keep it going. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, if anybody's interested, read that article. It's an interview with Bruce McGregor, who is the voice of Elvis. Uh, that was the voice of Elvis through anything uh, that my dad did with the uh, Elvis Sighting Society, the charity. Um, and uh, that's an interview with him. That's about a year. M my dad died in October 2011. That article is from January 2012. So Jesus, like only a couple of months after my dad died. I guess they really wanted to get that cat out of the bag quick. Um, but it's a few months after my dad passed. It might, it'll probably mention my dad's passing in there. And, uh, and it's an article with him and how they set it all up and everything that happened. So read that if you're interested. Uh, okay, five more minutes, five more minutes. David Ferguson says, being a Scotsman, I got quite emotional when I first saw Braveheart 25 years ago. Oh yeah, Braveheart's a good one, especially for somebody like yourself too. Yep, totally can understand that. Gary Rangel says, will there be a future to Terminator franchise? I, no, no, I think Terminator's done. Terminator's done, let it go, let it go. Just let it go. Maybe in another 20 years, you reinvent it. You reimagine it somehow. Or you remake it. You just remake it with somebody else other than Arnold. You reestablish a new timeline. You go small. Go small. Make, I think every single Terminator, I think Terminator 2 should be as, Terminator 2 should be as, as, high octane and as high budget as you get like like in terms of spectacle you know what i mean keep it grounded keep it feeling like that that low when i say low budget i don't mean no budget i mean low budget i don't mean like shitty i just mean in comparison right it's not a 250 million dollar movie it's like a 50 million dollar movie it's like what blumkamp did with with uh um uh what's that nine um uh Fucking, why am I drawing a blank on that? You know the one I'm talking about, the alien movie uh, he did. Like, like, do it like that. It should feel like that. That's what it should feel like. You know what I mean? It should feel like the first Terminator, you know? So, District 9, thank you. So, go back to that kind of feel for a Terminator film. You know, go small. That's what I think, anyway. I actually enjoyed Dark Fate. I didn't think Dark Fate was a great movie. I enjoyed it for the nostalgia, you know? But it was fine. I didn't like it any less than I liked Genesis. I didn't like it any, I liked it more than Salvation, you know, but I felt sort of on, I thought some of the CG in Dark Fate was just a little, you know, it was a little, just, you gotta go small, man. You gotta go small. That's how I feel anyway. That's how I feel. Um, all right, let's see here. Ba -dum -bum 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 -bum. Two more minutes, two more minutes, and then we will ski daddle, ladies and germs. Aaron Click says, I just think Terminator series is a disjointed mess. Well, it is. It is. It is a disjointed mess. So is the Halloween series. I mean, listen, I know Halloween, to, you know, 2018 is sort of beginning, you're, you're on track, but it's still disjointed. You got this version, that version, this version, that version. Yeah, it is. It's, beca it's because, well, there's a variety of reasons why, but it's just fucking ridiculous is what it is uh let me see uh let me see the manhammer ar-15 says dark fate was dope as fuck he liked it he liked it folks i enjoyed it i don't care to ever i don't i wouldn't watch it again i mean if it's on tv i might sit and watch it but it's not a movie i would buy uh david ferguson says uh you will never be able to beat the original terminator it was a great movie that's and again terminator 2 i think is amazing i mean that's the bar right but I think that's as high as you should go in terms of spectacle. Like, focus on character and story, you know? And, and uh, yeah, like, just the, the way they did... Like, three... I, I saw three in the theater. I enjoyed three for what it was. But I didn't like Genesis at all. And Fate was wild. I don't know. Yeah, it is. It's a mess. It's a fucking mess. It really is a fucking mess. All right, folks. That is going to do it for me for episode 36 of McCray Live. I want to thank for, I, I want to thank, thank for, I want to thank all, I want to thank all you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I will be back, of course. Uh, well, again, like I always say, there's always a chance I might be back with a standalone video if something kind of piques my interest or something drops or some news happens and I got to jump on and do something. That's always an opportunity or 
Always a chance I could do that. But if I don't, I will be back Thursday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time for episode 37 of McRae Live. It's hard to believe we're already up to 37 episodes. It's absolutely insane. Uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning into the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your continued support through Super Chats as well. Keeps these shows going, guys. Keeps these shows going. And thank you to my moderators for handling uh, what, who was more than likely Devante. Uh, thank you for handling that. You guys are amazing. I can't speak for anybody else as moderators, but I got some of the best in the biz uh, here on YouTube who just are awesome. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys uh, handling that appropriately and efficiently uh, as you guys do. So uh, yeah, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Uh, stay safe out there. Stay safe. Don't don't be socializing physically with. Just, just stay safe. Stay safe. I want to see all your all your uh, your 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 avatars uh, in this chat room each and every time I am there. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. I will talk to you guys soon. Have a great rest of your day. Alrighty. Wait, there we go. I got to do it on the bus. Cheers.